Terminal illnesses. Diseases or conditions that can't be cured and are expected to shorten one's lifespan. Terminal illnesses have unfortunately been around since the dawn of time, but with the help of modern medicine, some diseases that were once considered deadly like polio, tetanus, and hepatitis A are now curable. Many illnesses remain incurable though, such as cancer, which is currently the second leading cause of death in the US and has been around since at least 3000 BCE, with its first written description found in ancient Egyptian medical journals. It's unknown exactly how many people in the world are currently living with diagnosed terminal illnesses, but more than 1.7 million die from chronic diseases in the US each year. My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'm gonna to be sitting down with people who have terminal illnesses to learn what it's like to live with this diagnosis and how it can change one's perception of life and death. Are these individuals now driven to live life to the fullest with each moment they have left? Or is the constant reminder of how fickle life is too upsetting for them to find a moment of peace? Hello, Jeremy. Hello, Anthony. Ruthie. Hi. Kaylee. Hey, Anthony, thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for coming on here and teaching me about the world of living with a terminal illness. I hope that I can add some value to this conversation. What do you consider yourself? Uh, a person living with a terminal illness, uh, someone with a new perspective of life? I guess I am a person with a terminal illness, but I just call myself a cancer patient. Both of those, but more than that, a survivor. Someone who has lived life without considering what a retirement fund would look like. That's helpful. That's always on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> what type of terminal illness do you have and what are some of the symptoms that go along with it? I got diagnosed with a stage two slash three astrocytoma, which is a type of brain tumor. As of right now, like I don't really have many symptoms. It almost feels like my life is normal. I just have to take seizure medication, but that's about it. I live with uh, a disease called cystic fibrosis. My body has the inability to flush out excess fluids or mucus. This excess fluid, airway surface liquid or mucus, starts to build up in the lungs. What that does is it provides a breeding ground for bacteria to form and house and spread. Over the span of my entire lifetime, I've been battling lung infections. There is a decline in lung function that happens over the span of an X amount of years. And so for myself at 32 years old, my lungs function at about the 50% range. Is that, you know, one full deep breath in is 100, you are only able to ever feel like you're getting half a breath? Yeah. Langerhorn cell histiocytosis. Everyone has these Langerhorn cells in their body. Some of them are just dormant and mine are active. They produce more white blood cells and those are the things that fight off infection. All my white blood cells are fighting each other because they don't realize that the excess of them is the what the problem is. I'm tired all the time. I haven't had a pain-free day since I can't remember when. When did you first start feeling symptoms and when were you diagnosed? At 18 months old. So before you ever showed symptoms or anything? Well, I mean, I was showing symptoms in terms of, I was having a hard time with my digestion as a baby. And one of the, the weird quirks about the disease is that we tend to lose a lot of our, our electrolytes through our sweat. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy for us to become dehydrated. And because of this, our, our skin is, if you, you know, Anthony, if you were here and I asked you just to take a little lick of my <laughs> neck, which I'm sure you would, you I would, would be easily, delighted to. You Absolutely. Would del yeah. You would then lick my neck and go, wow, Jeremy, your skin tastes extraordinarily salty. And so somebody told my father this, where he was like, hey, I heard that people with CF have really salty skin. So why don't you just like, you know, this little baby, he's like, take him into the bath, give him a nice wash, clean him up, and then lick the back of his neck. And my dad's like, yeah, good idea. <laughs> So he takes me into this bath and he licks the back of my neck and it tastes extremely salty. My dad's heart ripped in two and he broke down onto his knees and he started bawling his eyes out because he, in that moment, knew in his heart of hearts that this was gonna be CF. And of course, later that week, I went in for what's called a sweat test and it turned out I had CF. Having been diagnosed that early, like CF is 
all that I know. May of 2011, and by the time I noticed that something was wrong, I literally like fell out of my car when I was trying to step down out of my truck and just doubled over in pain. And it turns out that I had a huge hole in my rib. So I had emergency surgery in November of 2011 and got a diagnosis a couple days later. When I found out that I had the seizure. Then I was able to look back a year before and remember something also weird that happened to me, but nothing that like led me to believe that there was any reason to go to the hospital. Mm. So when I found out it was a seizure, I went and yeah, the first thing to do is cat, do a CAT scan and then this big white tumor showed up. Were you diagnosed that day? They knew that I had to get surgery because it was giving me seizures. And then when they do the surgery, they take out as much as they can and then they send that tumor off for a biopsy. And that's what let me know like what type of tumor it is. And also like it helps them determine the stage based on how many of those cells are reproduce reproducing and how quickly. What so was your reaction to seeing that, that tumor? Actually, I, I laughed. You <laughs> laughed? <laughs> yeah. My boyfriend like, you know, he put his hand on my leg and was like ready to console me. And I was just like, what am I gonna tell my mom? <laughs> Did it almost not seem real or not seem like it was anything to be worried about? No, it didn't feel real. Do you remember the moment when you found out that it was terminal? After I recovered from my surgery a little bit, I had to prepare to get radiation treatment. So I had to go and meet with the oncologist. And like, it was probably like the second thing he said to me was like, yeah, so, so this tumor has a survival rate of about 10 years. A dark hole of depression and anxiety, not being able to be the person that I always was. You know, I was taking care of myself and everyone else. When I was 10 years old, I had found a pamphlet in my home that was titled All About Cystic Fibrosis. And there was a sentence in there that went on to like truly kick me in the center of the chest, which was, Cystic fibrosis is a fatal genetic disease. Late 90s, uh, I'm, you know, Mortal Kombat is like my life. <laughs> yes. I'm fully aware of like the word fatality and what fatal means. <laughs> I went on to read the, the rest of the sentence, which said, the average life expectancy of someone living with cystic fibrosis is 30 years of age. What was your reaction to, uh, to hearing that prognosis? Yeah, it hit me like a ton of bricks. So I'm 10. And, and this is what I've done in my life so far. And I can only do this much that I've done in my life two more times and then I'm dead. Did you talk to your parents about that? No, I didn't say a word to my parents. So you were just living with this, this knowledge now that your life was much more finite than you ever had to take in. I held on to a lot of deep seated anger towards my mom and my dad. And I never knew why I didn't, I couldn't, I, I mean, I know now, but at the time I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. My parents never knew that I knew until I was about 16 years old. And the way that they found out that I had known that CF was a fatal disease was by finding a autobiography that I wrote when I was 16 as a part of a school project. And I wrote this out and there was an entire section in there about my future. Man, I must've been listening to like My Chemical Romance or something <laughs> at the time. Like I was, yeah. I, got e I got emo as in this section called my Relatable. future and so my teacher had read this and they went oh shit and my teacher actually called my mom and and said have you read jeremy's autobiography and my mom was like no i didn't know what this was and she was like i highly suggest that you read it and my mom instead of coming to me to ask me to read it my mom, she went snooping through my room and she found the project. Is this your first time writing about this? Like you didn't have a journal on the side or anything that you wrote about it? At this point, I had never written anything down. And I think it was just stream of consciousness that just poured out of me onto the paper. And this is what it's, this is what it looked like. When it comes to thinking about my future and what I want to do with my life when it comes to getting married or having kids, I don't really know what to think. About 40% of children with cystic fibrosis live beyond the age of 18. The average lifespan for those who live to adulthood is 30 to 33. If you think about it, what's the point of getting married if I'm only going to live for a few years through the marriage? And having a kid would be pointless unless I wanted them to grow up over half their life without a dad. These kinds of things are hard to think about 
and it makes me feel kind of useless. That's extremely vulnerable. You know, I get why that teacher read that and was like, I got to call this kid's parents and let them know that he's expressing his deep internal battle. My parents were told, don't say anything because when he's ready to talk to you about it, he'll come to you. That never happened. Right. And so by the time I was 16, my mom and my dad, you know, they were like, he hasn't said anything yet. Like, where is he? Where's this conversation? And they think to themselves, holy shit, how long has he been? (laughs) Like, he's clearly thought this through. Like, how long has he been sitting on this? They made that decision for you, not necessarily because they, they thought you couldn't handle it, but because they were told that that was the only way that you would live your most fruitful life with the years that you did have. We as a culture need to change the way that we feel about the idea of death because it is this thing that is completely unavoidable. And the more we try to push it away and pretend that it's not something that's going to happen, the more harm it's going to do to us in the long run. Mm-hmm. The more we're able to embrace and 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 accept the idea that this is coming, the more we'll be able to live our lives to the fullest. Before we continue learning about the world of living with a terminal illness, I was very, very sick and I was in the intensive care unit and I received a package. I was very drugged up opening this package and I opened the package and I pull out a pink and black triple strap on. I just wanted to take a moment to once again, thank all of you for keeping the comments on these videos so encouraging for our guests as I cover topics that are highly sensitive like this one. All profits from this video will be donated to the American Cancer Society to help their fight to attack cancer from every angle. They provide healthy lifestyles to help prevent cancer, research cancer and its causes to find more answers and better treatments, fight for life-saving policy changes, and provide everything from emotional support to the latest cancer information for those who have been touched by cancer. For more information, or if you wanna make a donation of your own, I'll include a link to the American Cancer Society's website down in the description below. Now back to the world of living with a terminal illness. Has your perception of life and death changed since receiving your prognosis? Everybody that we know and everyone that we don't know is is going to die. Again, that's like the one, it's the one thing that we truly, truly all hold in common with one another. It's also, it just happens to be, especially here in the Western world, it happens to be the one thing that we all avoid and that we all yeah. fear. It's become something that we are almost ashamed of, the reality. And, you know, maybe... Maybe it's because we're taught that from kids that it's uh, it's too scary for us. Mm-hmm. And then we go into adulthood and there's never a chance for us to really sit with it. The furthest that we might go is an open casket viewing of some sort. And even that mm-hmm. is, is so rare that, you know, for the most part, we just shield our eyes, fake like it doesn't exist and live our lives just assuming that we will never die. I am one who embraces the idea of death. I think that death is a, there is a beauty to death. There's a beauty yeah. to a, 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 an ending. You look around at other cultures and other ideas of like, what does it mean to die? And, and what does it mean to take this vessel that we have that is our body and to maybe perhaps give back to the world that we live in? And there's these like mind boggling ideas that exist out there. Have you ever heard of a, a Tibetan sky burial? No. Can you explain that? This is like one of the most badass things I've ever heard in my entire life, right? So I mean, it sounds it. pretty sick. Just Tibetan <laughs> sky burial. Just, just <laughs> the three words together are they're, they're like poetry. Uh, somebody in the community dies and there's this, uh, this person within the community whose job it is to take the body out to this field. They lay the body out in this, you know, ritualistic way and they, with a, with a, you know, a cleaver and they chop it up into smaller pieces and lay it out in a way where it's, you know, presentable. While this is going on, off in the distance, there's like hundreds of vultures that are waiting and the vultures all flood in with like, with immense vigor and they, they pick apart and eat up all the parts of this body and then fly away up into the sky. You are literally giving what you have been made of back to the earth, back to the, the beings of the earth. When I'm dead, when I'm gone, like my shell, I don't, I don't have any attachments to it. Take it, mm-hmm. take it and use it however you need to. And right. to like 
give it back to the earth in that way where a bunch of like creatures who need that sustenance feed off of me and then fly off into the sky. I mean, that's the most like anime <laughs> badass. <laughs> and to me, that feels way more beautiful than, than the idea of like claiming a chunk of land underneath the earth that fills that space with concrete and, and junk and things that aren't needed, that don't, that don't serve the land that exists there to just house my skeleton. Right. I don't, yeah. need, I don't need that. Since receiving this prognosis, does talking about death make you at all uncomfortable? For me, talking about death, it's like I think about it every day. So it, it's not difficult to talk about but I don't want to upset the people I'm talking to. So yeah. I try to be like mindful of that. Like it might be easy for me to talk about it, but it might not be easy for them to hear it. So I, um. I try to like find a fair balance. Does it look like talking about death makes me uncomfortable? <laughs> no, dude, it's my, it, it is my favorite thing to talk. Like talking about death and talking about cinema are two of my favorite things. Like I, I would geek out on this shit every day, all day. I love it. I do love it. Do you have a bucket list or anything like that? It's funny you say that because no. <laughs> <laughs> no? If anything, the things that I started doing after I got my prognosis was just doing the things that like I want to do. Right. Like not necessarily come up with like this list of like these amazing things that like you need to see before you die. Because I don't know if I would actually want to do those things or if those would be things that like people on the internet just want to do. That could almost be you living uh, for someone else's dreams if you start going for right, those kinds yeah. of big showy things. So instead I just try to be honest about what I want and be like, yeah, this is what I want. I'm going to do this. I started traveling more to like get tattoos. I've collected a lot of tattoos since I got my prognosis because I've always liked them and I was just like, screw it. I'm just going to do it. So then I started doing that. Are there any things in your daily life that you used to stress about that no longer seem like something worth giving your stress to? Things that don't involve or concern me because <laughs> I don't have time for anything that doesn't bring me joy or that might put me in a negative mindset. Right. So if it doesn't directly involve me or my family or my sons or, you know, something that I'm passionate about, then I try not to give it any thought. Are there any unexpected ways that having a terminal illness diagnosis has brought you more clarity or contentment in life? It's having a direct conversation a one-to-one -one conversation with the people that I felt the, a deep desire to forgive. And that was with my mom and dad. And I felt like I needed to forgive them for the harm that I had felt that they had done to me by not expressing to me the fact that cystic fibrosis is a fatal disease. That was one of the most pivotal moments of my entire life. How did your life change most once you kind of came to terms with this, because that probably also was a moment where you came to terms with your diagnosis as, or with your prognosis as well. I've said this a thousand times and I'll say it a thousand times over again. Cystic fibrosis is hands down the most incredible thing that's ever happened to me because it's given me this ability to, to really like to really see the world through this lens of this lens of appreciation that is so vast because again, like, and I think I said this earlier, it's like, I, I've meditated on the idea that I'm going to die. That doesn't make me special. We're all going to die. Every single one of us are. Yeah. But because I've been born into this body that has some sort of glitch in the genes, I've had to sit down with myself and think about the fact that I'm probably going to die before all of my peers. And if that is the case, how do I want to spend the rest of the time that I have here on this earth? Mm -hmm. Do I want to squander it away and mope about and, and waste time crying about the, the shit that doesn't matter? Or do I want to just look forward and do every single thing that I can to make the most out of the time that I have here? Pick up your iPhone right now. Go to your, <clears throat> go to your clock app. I'm going to do it right now. Let's do, do this. Right Let's do yeah, this. Anthony, do, put nine and a half hours from now. Okay. Got it. And now hit start. Nine hours, 29 minutes, 53 seconds, counting down. That's how much time <clears throat> you have from right hours. now 
until the time you're going to die. What are you going to do in that time to ensure that you feel you good about how you are going to exit this world? What All are right. the things that you feel like you need to say that you didn't say yet that you've been putting off to the side? Just take the next nine and a half hours to do the things that will make you feel like, you know what? I tied a bow on the day and I'm good to go. With this timer counting down here, I, I immediately want to reach out to my loved ones, make amends with uh, maybe some old friends who maybe we have some unsaid things that just have never been resolved. Makes me want to uh, treat people well, make people excited about their day, maybe give people a reason to smile. It makes me want to get off social media and just like be in nature and really appreciate the things in my day that actually matter to me. And not because I'm trying to set myself up for uh, a future that I may never even get to experience, but because all that really matters is the here and now when you have this timer counting down. This doesn't have to be a thing that is that exists passively in the back end that you don't need to think about. As scary mm -hmm. as it is to think about it. It exists, it's there. We all have that timer above our heads showing us exactly how long we have till the, our, we take our last breath. Your life is going to end. And that's not a scary thought. That is a truly beautiful thing to think about. Do you ever feel like people underestimate what you're capable of because you have a terminal illness? I think that they think that I'm like constantly depressed and upset. And when people see me like happy and like having fun or talking positively, they like call me inspirational or something. And I'm like, I didn't do anything. <laughs> there, are, there are lots of people that um, say something positive every once in a while. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think they're surprised when I can like be positive. Do you think the U.S. healthcare system is as efficient and accessible as it should be? No, absolutely not. The criticism I always get for my opinion is that, well, America has the best hospitals and the best doctors in the world. And that's probably true, to be honest. It's probably true, but only if you, one, can afford it, and two, what, are able to travel to New York City where you can see those doctors, because those doctors don't exist in the countryside like where I'm from. If I had to get everything done that I got done here in Tokyo back home, that would have required an insane amount of driving to the hospital because I live in the countryside in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know where the best, closest, affordable hospital would even be. So how do you think that the U.S. could learn from the medical practices in, in Japan, at least? Americans are much more likely to like donate money to charity than a lot of other countries. But when it comes to doing things like paying taxes or paying into these like socialized healthcare systems, they turn to this like, oh, well, I don't want to help. I don't want to pay for other people's stuff type of mentality. Yeah. But here in Japan, it's more communal. Like people realize the greater good of doing these types of things yeah. and they see the benefit for themselves. Mm -hmm. Like they're able to go to the hospital and get the treatment that they need. And no one really ever complains about it. So I kind of wish that Americans could see the benefit of this type of system and not just assume like the worst. I hear that people say like, oh, well, there's gonna be long, long lines. And I'm like, you can have a mixture of privatized and socialized healthcare. Like, and it will be fine. Allow the rich and powerful people to continue right. doing what they do. Exactly, yeah. But everyone else, I feel, would greatly benefit from, from having access to healthcare like they do in other countries. And it's so strange that so many of us get caught in all the scary what ifs, what could happen if something changes, when there is a period of transition that could happen where both options are readily available. Exactly, yeah. Fang wants to know what the worst way is that anyone's ever tried to comfort you. I was very, very sick and I was in the intensive care unit and I received a package and this care package did not have a return to sender. I was very drugged up opening this package and I opened the package and I pull out uh, a pink and black triple strap on <laughs> and so i pull this triple strap on up all drugged up like i i don't even know where i am right and so i go huh, what the? and the nurse looks at it and goes well then and just it just exits not even worth finishing checking your vitals. At yeah, that. yeah. She was like, you know, your O2 stats are good. Uh, your blood pressure, I'll get that tomorrow. You're, she I'm was, good. She was going to get her vitals checked at that point. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I still, to this day, have no idea who sent that to me. <laughs>
<laughs> still to this day. That was that was like three years ago. Still to this day, it was one of the best moments of my life. Caroline wants to know if living with a terminal illness has made you more willing to to take more chances or more risks in your life. I feel like I'm more willing to like just be honest to people and say what I feel like I need to say. Whereas like maybe before you'd be like, oh, it would be uncomfortable if I addressed this tension or something like that. Yeah, totally. You know, like it, it's it's shaped my life in, in many different ways. I'm not more like risk, inclined to risk as in Putting yourself like, in harm's way like, every day. Yeah, like of. like riding a motorcycle without my helmet on or yeah. driving the car without my seatbelt. But I do think that it's completely shifted the way that I think about things that most people might look at and think, nah, not for me. You know, right. whereas I go, mm, maybe not for me, but also could it be for me? Because it sounds kind of exciting. And if it's exciting right. and it makes life more worth living, why the f not? Swipe's wife, Jess, wants to know if when you're planning for the future, if planning for your funeral is part of that process. In the beginning, like maybe I did, I would be like, oh, I want to be cremated instead of buried because we're going to run out of land on the earth someday. Yeah, and then there you go <laughs> thinking about the earth's well-being <laughs> exactly. rather than your own. When I thought about it a little more, I realized like funerals aren't really for the dead. I'm going to be dead. They're for the living. And when I thought about that, I realized, you know, what? just whatever my family wants to do, it's for them. I want a, just a bitchin' party that I know my <laughs> wife is going to plan. Yeah. And then in terms of what happens to my body, I really do want my body to give back. Do what you will with this vessel as long as it does something good. And so if that's donating it to science or if that's feeding it to a giant horde of hungry vultures, <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'm, right. I really am. If there's anyone watching who's been diagnosed with a terminal illness and is having trouble coming to terms with that, having trouble accepting the fact that their fate is so much shorter than they once assumed it would be. Is there anything that you'd want to say to them? It f***ing sucks. It sucks. There's nothing fun about living with a terminal illness. There's a lot that goes with that that sucks. Having to express that to your loved ones, to your friends, to your family, having to juggle the the thoughts that come to mind when you have to think about your own mortality in such a short span of time. But the one thing that I will say that I truly deeply believe in is that every single experience, even the ones that are so, so hard, comes with a host full of experiences that are so perfectly comedic. It is so worth it to root out and mine for the humor that does exist within that human experience. Because if we are not able to laugh at the hardships that we go through, then what's the point? Humor is a matter of perception. You know, that's why some days you have your good days, you laugh a lot. You have your bad days, you're not in the mood to laugh. And it really is that perception there. There might not be anything different between the two days. It's your perception. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest misconception about people with terminal illnesses? That we're fragile, broken shells of a human being that can't do anything for ourselves anymore. You still can do things for yourself. You still want to do things for yourself. There are some things that I need help with, but for everything that I can't do and I need help with, I will go out of my way to find two or three more things that I can. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly in the camera. Go. Find me on YouTube at Kaylee Chips. I encourage you to reach out to anyone you know going through something like this, whether you're the sick one or not. Check out Sick Boy Podcast. It's me and my two best friends talking to other people living with chronic or terminal disease. Love you. Snapchat and my Instagram is both uh, Princess Beauty MUA. Look into and donate to Black Lives Matter. If you like this shit, then you definitely want to be subscribing to Anthony Padilla. <laughs> Hit that subscribe button below because you know what's up. Hit it. Don't quit it. Just hit it. <laughs> hit it. Thank you so much, Ruthie. I feel like I understand the world of living with a terminal illness just a little bit more. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. After spending the day with these people with terminal illnesses, 
I've learned just how strong and resilient one must be to not only receive this diagnosis, but to bravely speak about their deeply personal stories in front of millions of people. It's important to remember that everyone has a personal battle to fight and we should all be accepting and supportive because you never truly know what may be occurring behind the scenes. See you later, bye guys. Press the like. And to make it really, really hit home, when that timer goes off and you get that like, Da 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 or whatever. Right. I I want you to take a fist and just punch yourself in the face as hard as you can, <laughs> just so that you have an idea of like maybe it hurts a bit when you die. You know, it's like normalize it. Just uh -huh. punch uh -huh. yourself in the head. And oh then man, it's like, you know, I am excited. Like, my my nose is ready for it, man. I am ready to have to snap some cartilage after this. <laughs>